right, good evening. So let me just begin uh, just by thanking uh, Southgate and all the elders and just everyone that's had a part in, uh, in bringing me out. Uh, as I always like to, to say, I never take uh, the, the confidence expressed by allowing me to stand behind someone's pulpit. Uh, I never take that loosely. Um, if you've been around long enough, you've seen, um, <laughs> you've seen some unusual characters standing behind various pulpits, and so um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I always appreciate it, and I, I, uh, I'll, I'll try wicked hard not to let you down. <clears throat> That's my Bostonian, the wicked, wicked hod, but so I've, from Boston, but I have actually been in Kansas City now for uh, 23 years. I was, um, yeah, I know. I always dreamed of living somewhere beautiful. <laughs> I actually live in, it's, you know, it could be worse. I live in a town called Grandview, and I'm thinking about suing <laughs> for false advertising. <laughs> On the other hand, I will say this, um, I have to is the deer from Grandview taste way better than any other deer. Do you, do you know why, Nathan? I have no idea. A lot of people are like, why? Because at night, they all go over and they eat out of the dumpster at Burger King. <laughs> and so they're, they're literally flame-grilled, beef-fed venison. It's, it's amazing. But um, enough of the joke. So you guys have that worship team and Penky. You guys are blessed as a church. Uh, how, many, how many here are visiting that are not from this church? Hey, Julie. Wow, okay, so probably about a third. That was, that was a treat just to be able to get the worship was fantastic. So let me just say this. Um, with regard to the issue of the end times, let me just frame this uh, before I jump in. And let me do my stopwatch before I jump into. The issue of the end times is, uh, as Pastor mentioned earlier, it's, it's such a minefield to navigate, and it's such an easy issue to, um, to get off track and off focus and off target. And, and there are so many sort of diversions and, and dangers and pitfalls, uh, as he said. I always like to just sort of simplify the matter and sort of remove a lot of the misconceptions. I, uh, I'm sort of one of these guys that doesn't have any um, social media intelligence, and so I'm not supposed to do this, but I'll just start arguing with some random jerk on Twitter, and um, it just looks bad, makes you look like an idiot, but again, it's the Bostonian in me. But so... Occasionally, I'll just get in some argument with, with some atheist. And, uh, you know, I always love, to me, the basic argument from design. You know, the fact of the matter is I am not the best machine in the world, but I am a machine. Like, this is, this is better than magic. Watch this. Okay, up here, there's this organic computer, and it grew... After, you know, out of my mother's womb, and it's developed to where it is today, despite the abuse that I put it through. Now, watch this. I'm going to think something up here, and I'm going to make something happen. Okay? You guys ready? <laughs> that is, like, amazing. Like, do you understand the machinery that it is required to make that happen? Now, just to take it a step further. Woo, hot dog in it. There is no one in the world that convinced me that machines grow up out of the ground. Do you know what I mean? Like, machines don't just happen. And um, this is just, you know, simple common sense. Now, when you, when you get into debates with atheists, they're quick to retreat from the realm of simple, common, everyday, common sense reasonableness to quick, quickly get over to philosophical, ontological certainty. Well, you could be a, va uh, a brain in a vat that's being stimulated to believe that you're in this world, but you're really not. That is possible. And you're like, yes, that is possible. 
whatever you do, don't ever go to Las Vegas with me because you're making bets on some of the most ridiculous things. You know what I mean? It's like, that's just like idiotic. Don't get me wrong, I don't go to Vegas, although I was just there this week um, for a technology conference. That city literally makes me sick. Like, I was like, I actually changed my, I was like, I got to get out of here. I'm going to get sick. That's beside the point. But here's the thing is, then what the atheists do when you point out the fact that the world around us is dripping with design. And you know, just point to a tree. Name anything on it. The bark. The bark has purpose. The bark is part of the machine. Na you know, anything you name, it's a machine. It's an oxygen-making machine. And, and it's got flowers. And the Lord made beauty. And, you know, it's just... Everything around us is, a, is part of this giant machine, but they're quick to point out, oh, but then there's genetic disorders. You know, there's natural evil, and that disproves God. That's about as stupid as saying that because my car gets a flat tire, that that thing was not designed. Of course it was designed. But here's the point. Here's the point that I'm getting to. I know you guys aren't the jerk from Twitter, so some, forgive me for arguing. But here's the point is that in this present age, there's clear evidence that we were created by a designer and, you know, he made us. But in this present age, things are broken. And so the atheists have a point. There are right now, in this present age, genetic disorders. There are diseases. There is death. The, the, the system has a flat tire right now. And until the day of the Lord, that will continue the end times is not about primarily the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and all of these things. Although those things are important for us to understand, those really in the big picture are peripheral. The end times is simply about this. It's about the end of genetic disorders. It's about the end of human trafficking. It's about the end of abortion. It's about the end of death. Well, not quite the end of death. You know, it's, death will be on its way out at the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord in the end times is about biblical hope. You know, we're all saved if we have faith in Jesus. We're saved, but this is not all there is right now. We're not living in the fullness of all that he, you know, the kingdom and all of the principles that he died for are not fully ours now. You know, it's not, the gospel is not, you can have your cake and eat it too. It's embrace the cross now and you will inherit the cake right. after the day of the Lord, at the day of the Lord. And so, you know, so much of the church today is filled with a passion for the issue of justice. So much of the youth are burning concerning the issue of justice. And I believe the Lord has put that on the hearts of his people in this, in this season, and, and I believe that's leading up to the day of the Lord. But then so much of the youth at the same time say, well, the end times, that's just a big distraction. Like, it's like, that's for the weirdos. And, you know, and, and admittedly, sometimes the issue of the end times can be a bit of a weirdo magnet. Believe me, I'll show you my email sometime. However, we need to understand that the essence of the day of the Lord is about justice. Amen. It's all about justice. And, you know, in this present age, we will minister to the poor. We will rescue those enslaved. We will do all of those things. But ultimately, they are all just signs pointing to the day when everyone in Christ is getting delivered. Amen. When every sickness will be healed. Every, you know, everyone in Christ will be given immortality. And so this is all the end times is about. It's about, yes, admittedly, we have to understand the events that precede the day of the Lord. But the main focus is the day of the Lord and the return of our king and our bridegroom and the establishment of his kingdom. That's all it's about. It's about the day when the Lord will be vindicated. Because in this present age, the atheists obviously are wrong. You know, again, machines don't grow out of the ground. Like, they like to, you know, use all the derogatory, like, go ahead, worship your sky wizard. I like to turn it around and go, yeah, robots just pop out of the ground. Yeah, that's rational. You know what I mean? Like, do the same thing. Like, when they try to use all this hyper-intellectual language, just say, explain that again as if to an 11-year-old. You know, when you remove all of the big flowery scientific, you know, terms and you just say, explain that in simple terms, it sounds stupid because what you're saying is that machines happen. No, they don't. 
And so, but the point is this, they do have a point. The Lord presently is not vindicated. The day of the Lord is the day when the Lord will be vindicated. And we need to be burning and yearning for the day of the Lord. I'll just say this again. I'll just make another point and jump into the, uh, the message. What we often do as Christians, who, even those who have been discussing the issue of the end times, and uh, you know, maybe many of you are really there, is often we say this. We say, man, we're just, we're really, we're like, we want Jesus to return so bad. It's like my, my passion, my hope. But then the singles, they say, but I really just hope he waits until I get married. <laughs> right? And... Um, and then once you get married, you're like, man, I'm like all about the return of Jesus. But then you go, I just hope he waits until we have kids. And then you have the kids and you go, man, I, I just, I yearn, like, come Lord Jesus. I just hope I can walk my daughter down the aisle before he returns. And then you're like, you know, I just hope that I'll have grandchildren. Like, I really want him to come back. And again, we need, and listen, these things are all valid. It's not a religious guilt trip. But the point is this, we need to understand that right now, God the Father is in heaven and he hears the cry of every single little seven and eight year old girl that are living in cages because they're in, in the human trafficking industry being abused with torture, unimaginable, yearning, maybe not even having language or an understanding, but feeling the groan the groan that all of creation is experiencing. And so hopefully this weekend we can um, discuss some of the reasons why we need to recover the groan. You know, I'm convinced that much of the church today, especially the comfortable Western church, we've lost the groan. We've settled for sort of this, you know, the kingdom is now mentality and it's all about establishing the kingdom now. And listen, I understand that we are, you know, working hard to proclaim the gospel in this present age, but it's not primarily about this age. It is about yearning for the age to come. That's biblical. The overwhelming emphasis of the scriptures is yearning for the age to come. My hope is that through this weekend, we can understand a, a biblically balanced understanding of the end times and then how we respond to that, how that affects our daily walk and how that affects you know, everything from justice ministries to just you know, everything down, down the road. How we understand biblical hope it just filters out into everything in, in our daily life. Holiness, purity, all of these things. It's, it's a critical, critical issue. So I want to jump into the message. Um, that's not bad, by the way. Ten minutes for me before I even get to it. It usually takes me 20. So that was pretty good. Um, the, me the title of the message tonight is the, the Covenant Promises of God. The Promises of God. These things always crack me up because every time I turn, I start going... start analyzing things. I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, or you notice the bald spot. You're like, it's getting thinner. Um, I'm convinced that <clears throat> understanding the very foundation of the scriptures, which is the Abrahamic covenant, and then the covenants that follow, is one of the most basic foundational concepts that Christians need to understand, which is probably one of the single most commonly um, misunderstood or simply vaguely understood concepts in all of the scriptures. Understanding the Abrahamic covenant and then the Mosaic and the Davidic and the new covenant and how these things unfolded, this is literally like new believers class, Bible 101. And yet I'm amazed, I'll talk to mature, you know, seasoned believers, and I'll say, what is the Abrahamic covenant? And I'm amazed how frequently people throw out something like, um, I will bless those that bless thee, curse the, you know, just sort of vague things that are somewhere in Genesis, but they're not quite sure exactly what the Abrahamic covenant really is and what it's about. And, uh, and so tonight is really just about reviewing the covenants, and in this we'll see uh, why these things are so critical for believers to understand and why understanding these things will bring clarity to so many other issues which are so hotly contested in the church by the believing community today. 
simply understanding the basics of the covenants. And, and, and by doing this, really just stepping into a Jewish mindset, I, you know, to, to step into the mindset of the first century disciples and, and go, this was just commonly understood material to the first century Jewish believer. And yet, again, by and large, I'm, I'm amazed at how many uh, believers really don't understand these things. So go ahead and just jump into the first slide. I just begin it by saying this. Understanding the end times, the big picture of the end times, is as simple as understanding that the Lord has made a series of promises. The God of heaven and earth, the creator of all things, has personally made a series of vows, of promises to individuals and to uh, collective groups of people. And the issue really comes down to, is the Lord a promise keeper or is he not a promise keeper? His very integrity is at stake. When, in, in terms of these issues, it really is about the very integrity and faithfulness of God. And do we affirm his integrity and his faithfulness and his reliability or do we not? And so ultimately these promises will result in his, his larger grand purpose and plan of redeeming all of creation. It will lead up to that, the cosmic redemption of all things. And it's very simple. We understand that God made a series of promises and when they are fulfilled, then all of his plans will be fulfilled and there is a very real Satan and his minions and, and willing vessels throughout history and throughout the earth today, who are raging against the fulfillment of his purposes and promises. Very simple. And the closer we get, and this is important, the closer that we get to the time that these purposes and promises are fulfilled, the greater that Satan will rage. And the scriptures say that. He's thrown down. He knows his time is short. He's in rage. The closer that we approach that hour, the more that the rage of Satan, and again, his puppets throughout the earth, those that submit themselves to his will, will rage, and the bloodier it will become. But it's ultimately for a very brief season. We need to remember that. So I just want to begin where you're never supposed to begin, which is with sort of technical theological issues which lose everyone. But let me just begin by defining some complex issues, and then we'll just move on to the easy stuff. But I want to begin by defining supersessionism. Yep. Another term commonly used is replacement theology. Replacement supersede. It's the same word. Supersessionism, replacement theology. Uh, I just like to use the word supersessionism. It basically holds that God is done with corporate Israel, with the physical bloodline descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, notice that I did not say that supersessionists believe that God is done with Jews. Because they'll say, no, any Jew can still come and join the church. Right? God's not, God's, it's open to everyone, every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. And they'll call it inclusion theology or fulfillment theology. This is, by the way, and, and I trust that I won't offend too many people, this is just like Hillary Clinton. Um, she doesn't want to openly say she's a liberal, so she'll say she's a progressive, right? It's just like when people don't want to, you know, admit what they are, they find other words to try to make it sound better. Replacement theology, they get upset and they say, well, this is sort of a derogatory term. So then they say, we, uh, you know, ascribe to inclusion theology or fulfillment theology. I call it divorce theology because that's what it is. It is a vile attack against the very integrity of God. And I know that's a strong challenge. And listen, there are some very godly, amazing men and women out there that embrace replacement theology. This is not an attack on any individual. It's an attack on the ideas that are so commonly, unfortunately, embraced throughout much of the church and which are often spreading, particularly in many of the seminaries today and um, for some reason among the youth. You know, we're all susceptible to trends, but, uh, you know, the, the youth always tend to be a little bit more susceptible to, to trying to get on board what everybody's doing. I think we get a little bit older, we care less, but ultimately we, we always care. And, you know, let me just say this as sort of a side note. Um, within the world of, of debate, you know, whether, whatever debate it may be, whoever controls the narrative controls the argument. You know, so you go back to the classic story of David and Goliath, 
That's just like a classic narrative that has been repeated a million times. The young little shepherd boy with a few stones coming against the big old giant warrior who's mocking and condescending, and he takes him out with a smooth stone, and everyone identifies with the underdog. That's another whole sermon. But then, you know, you get, to the, you get to the story again of Jesus. It's kind of a repeat of the David and Goliath story. You've got the young revolutionary preacher who's coming against the giant, crusty, um, calcified religious aristocracy of, and power of the day, you know, speaking truth to power and, you know, that whole narrative. Well, today, the supersessionist argument, that this is kind of the way it's framed. You know, picture your, your, your average young guy, woman at seminary, 24, whatever, and, uh, and you look out, and on one hand, you see the face of those who are not supersessionists, and the, the face is, and, and don't get me wrong when I say this, I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to be honest, but it's, it's you know, it's John Hagee, so you've got kind of this, this, you know, old white, pastor from Texas who the Bible says this and that and the other thing and God and Israel that's a match made in heaven hallelujah right and then on the other side you have this this very soft spoken British Ang you know Anglican vicar who you know is a graduate of Oxford and I was a dispensationalist until I went and lived and saw the injustices and the abuse, you know, and, and you know, it's this very soft-spoken air and veneer of humility. And on one side, you have, I would argue, a, an overemphasis on nationalism and, and the political side of things. And on the other side, equally, you have racism and you know, anti-Semitism and an emphasis on Palestinian nationalism. And we are not nationalists, we are about the kingdom of God and the gospel. But the, the bottom line is your average 22 year old kid looks at this and goes, I'm gonna go with a soft-spoken Anglican vicar from Oxford. They're not gonna go like, yeah, I really wanna be just like John Hagee in 50 years. You know what I mean, it's just, it's not, and unfortunately, that's just the way things work. And so the narrative needs to be regained by the thoughtful, gospel-oriented church who understands. And, 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 and don't get me wrong, I'm far more in agreement with the theology of Hagee, although I understand that these guys have some points about issues of justice, but their theology is wrong. And so the issue, we have to... We have to get back to a gospel-oriented approach to all of these issues and understand the, a biblical approach to Israel. And so that was a side note. That's the one thing you're not supposed to do when you're discussing complicated theological issues because then everybody's doubly distracted. But uh, let me just get back to the PowerPoint. Supersessionists hold that God removed, now hear this, God used to be dealing with the corporate people, the family of Israel, but he removed his dealing with them. And then he, he removed it and placed it on a new people, the church. And, and the church is a mixture of all sorts of different people, right? Now, we agree that the body of Christ is from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. But hear this. When we're dealing with the corporate people of Israel, there is no future grace. It's done. Now, hear me. Listen, guys. I'm a believer, I've been a believer for, I don't know, since 91. I'm not good at math. And um, what's that, 25 years? I get up every morning and I thank him for his mercy every morning. I thank him for his grace. You know, they're new every morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. But not for Israel, because they sinned too many times. They really just crushed it. You know what I mean? Like. They had so many chances and they blew it one too many times. Do you know how terrifying that is if that's true? I don't want to live in that world. I believe his mercies are new every morning. And I believe his, his, that speaks to his character. And once we say that God just got tired finally of Israel, we're in big trouble ourselves. If we, if we want to affirm the faithfulness of God, and that's what this issue is about, it's, it's, if it's good for us, it's, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I don't even know what that means. 
so supersessionists hold that the church, this term the church, the ecclesia, is the new and the true Israel, right? So that's the basic definition of replacement theology. Again, if someone holds replacement theology, they're going to try to couch it in different terms and word it, most of them. Now go to the next slide. This one individual, on the other hand, is a bit bombastic. He's a very well-educated guy, but I'm just going to read this quote. This is from his book, Jesus vs. Jerusalem. Um, I'll, I'll just say his name. Uh, it, it's Joel also, Joel McDermott. And so he is the successor to a guy named Gary DeMar at a ministry called American Vision. And so this is his discussion, as you can see, a commentary on Luke 9. But I want you to see when someone doesn't try to truly hide what replacement theology is all about and they just sort of lay it out there, I want you to see what replacement theology, what it is and what it ultimately the fruit that it produces, the mindset that it produces. So this is from his book. He says, the old Jewish people, they were not merely exiled from their kingdom someday to return. So look, you go back to the history of Israel, and at various times they were exiled, but then the Lord brought them back. You know, they, they, they sinned, the Lord brought prophets, he warned them, and then they were sent out. You know, you had the Assyrian exile, the Babylonian exile, but in the first century, Rome came and, well, it spread out over about a period of 50 years from 70 AD up until the Bar Kokhba rebellion, but the Jews were dispersed. So this is what he's speaking of. He's saying the old Jewish people. Now, he doesn't mean the, um, you know, the, uh, those above 60. He's, he's not the elderly. He's referring to like the Old Testament Israel, the Israel that Jesus grew up in and was part of, the old Israel. They were not merely exiled from their kingdom someday to return. No, this time the kingdom was taken from them and given to the true nation bearing the fruits thereof. That's us, the church. Christ created a new bride. Why would Christ desire to return to the whore he has cast aside and divorced when he has a pristine bride descending from heaven, clothed in righteousness, uncorrupted by idolatry? Forgive me when I say this, but this is the kind of God that Donald Trump would really get along with. He doesn't. He left that whore riding her patron, the beast of Rome, and the great mother of harlots suffered the judgment of her whoredom. She was divorced and disinherited. The inheritance now belongs to the bride. Do you see why I call it divorce theology? It teaches that God divorced his first bride, determined that she was a whore, and said, you're done forever. I'm going to go get me a new pristine younger model, a new bride. How does this cast God? How does this speak to the character of who God is? Well, let's just be honest. Is this a God that you're excited to worship? Yet half of the church basically affirms this. Again, they may try to word it differently, but that is what is being expressed. And believe me, when you believe these things, there are profound implications, one for how we relate to and treat Israel, and also for how we relate to God. And as we'll see, the scriptures allow, leave no room for this. There is no room for this because this is not what God is like. This is not what the Father is like. Was Israel a whore? The scriptures say yes. But then God says, I'm going to restore them. I'm going to restore them. And do you know something? Are we all harlots? Yes, thank you. Amen. <laughs> Preach it, brother. The Lord saved us because of his mercy. He didn't, with, in my case, he didn't look down. It's not because we deserve it, because we're really good. I, I guarantee you, the Lord wasn't just sitting up in heaven and he looked down and he was like, man, this little guy is really good at dealing drugs. I'm just going to call him. No. He was like, this guy deserves to go to hell. I'm going to have mercy on him. And that's exactly what he did. I should be in hell right now. So now restorationism is a term that I've coined and I'm trying to use, so spread it around, hashtag restorationism. Um, it's a term that I'm trying to use to just explain the opposite of supersessionism. Restorationism very simply holds that the New Testament passages must be understood through the lens of the Lord's previous covenantal promises. 
You know, there, there's sort of a, a cyclical way that we approach the Bible. We begin with the beginning. I mean, can you imagine that? Trust me, especially if you're a former drug addict, you don't start at Revelation. You start at the beginning. You work your way forward. And then you get to the New Testament, and it gives new insight and information, and then you go back to the Old Testament with greater clarity. But there is a natural unfolding of how the Lord has revealed things. And Jesus' Jewish audience, they were thoroughly Old Testament literate. They grew up on the Old Testament. If we want to have a, the mindset of his first century Jewish apostles, disciples, we also need to become Old Testament literate. It's very simple. The judgments and the chastisements on Israel, the nation of Israel, in the first and second century resulting in the desolation of Jerusalem under Titus and then moving forward again until 123, whenever the Bar Kokhba rebellion was, and which resulted in the exile of the Jewish people, it was temporary. It was not permanent. And they're in the process of being restored right now. God's promises are never annulled, period. And this is just very simple. God doesn't break his promises. That's all we're arguing. God does not break his promises. God is faithful, period. So let's go ahead and jump in. The Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 15, 1 through 4. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. This is before Abram and, and Sarai, their names were changed to, Abraham and Sarah. The Lord comes to Abram in a vision. What does he say? Do not fear, Abram. I'm a shield to you, and your reward shall be very, very great. So he, he speaks of a reward. Now, I've got a five-year-old son. You know, it's kind of like you mentioned, like, hey, if you do this, I got a surprise. Surprise? What surprise? You know, like, they're locked. What is it? What's, what do you have? What, what do you have for me? And is, is kind of, I see this a little bit in Abram. Abram's like, Lord, what will you give me? What? What's this great reward that you're referring to? What? You said something about a reward? You know? And he goes, what's the reward? Because I don't have any children. The only, you know, and back then, they think in terms of uh, inheritance, how can I pass it on? The only, there's this guy that was born in my household, and he's one of my servants, but he's not my child. His name's Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you haven't given me any actual children, offspring. So this guy, Eleazar, everything's going to go to him. And then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man is not going to be your heir, but one who will come forth from your body. He's going to be your heir. So he's saying, listen, Abram, I'm going to give you children, and you're going to have heirs to pass on the reward that I just referred to. And I love this. The Lord took him outside, verse 5, and he said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. I'll just say this. Um, you know, the stars in St. Louis and Kansas City are not the stars of the Jordanian desert. You get out there, and it's like, you're like, is it cloudy? No, that's the Milky Way. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's crazy the difference when you get away from the cities. You get up on a mountain. You get out in the desert. You get out there on the ocean where there's no lights, and you're like, you know, there's, the, there's so many stars, you feel like you can hear them. You know, they're like, you know, I mean, it looks like they're moving. It's crazy. This was the type of night that Abraham looked up, and the Lord says, count the stars. If you can count them so shall your descendants be. You're not just going to have a child. You're going to have a multitude is going to come forth from you. And this is just beautifully prophetic po poetry that the Lord is, is doing. Verse 6 through 8, Abraham believed the Lord. It's about trust. He's, he basically said, this guy's faithful. The Lord who is speaking these things to me is faithful. And the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. We won't get into that. And so the Lord said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans, basically out of the region of Iraq, to give you this land to possess it. Now, it begins with the land. I've, why have I brought you out? It's to give you and your descendants this piece of land. And he said, how will I know? Like, how can you promise me that I will possess it? Verse 9. So now the Lord begins this process, this this very liturgical process to make the promise. A very ritualistic, I'll say liturgical process to make the promise. He says, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat. Okay, so a cow, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. And he brought all these to him and he cut them in two, except for the birds. And he lays them half opposite each other. He basically makes a path. Um, 
where's Caleb? So I don't know how many years ago this was now, several years ago. So um, you guys, most, how, you, no one here probably knows, but Jeremy Johnson had just moved to Kansas City and a friend of ours, and he had bought a, um, well, he was renting a little hobby farm. So this guy he was renting a house and they had goats. And so Matt Quinn came over, Jeremy called a friend, some friends up and he said, will you guys <laughs> help me slaughter the goats? Because I can't feed them. So he goes, I figure we'll slaughter the goats and have a uh, party. And so we went over, and then, um, where's Penky? The, so then Walesi came over. Walesi is this guy from Hawaii. So he grew up slaughtering goats. So, you know, I had never slaughtered a goat. How many people here have slaughtered a goat? <laughs> Not too many people. Increasingly less. And, um, you know, the way that you slaughter a goat the way you're supposed to do it is you take a ball peen hammer and you crack them in the head and knock them out. This is the most humane way of doing it. So I thought, that's pretty brutal, whacking the goat in the head with a hammer. So I brought over my 22 caliber pellet rifle. It's just a pellet rifle. I thought I'll just pop him in the head. He'll go to sleep. La-di-da, goat curry. There is a lot that happens in between popping them in the head in goat curry. And so we start dragging the big male over to the tree. Jeremy had three kids who had already named all the goats. We start dragging Billy over and, and we thought, do we pop them in the head first and string them up or do we string them up and then pop them? So we thought string them up, pop, Good night, Billy. No problemo. I popped him in the head, and Billy started screaming for the police. <laughs> ah! I mean, like, you've seen the videos on YouTube. It was horrible. It sounded like he was saying words. It's like, oh, Joe, what have you done to me? I was happy minutes ago. And so... We we're like, hurry. And so Walesi, you know, Walesi's like, what? You never slaughtered a goat? You know, like, this is like what we did for fun as kids. Yep. And so he just. <laughs> Walesi starts cutting Billy's head off. And I'll admit, for a minute, I thought, someday that's going to happen to me on YouTube. But anyway, sorry, bad joke. So, um, we cut Billy's head off. The kids are screaming and crying. And um, how many of you guys have seen my little internet TV show that I do called The Underground? If you happen to see a skull on my desk, <laughs> that's Billy. Um, all it is is basically two shofars on a skull. But. Um, it is, it's Billy. So I brought Billy's head home and I let the chickens pick it clean. And then I, um... <laughs> okay, so here's my point. Here's my point. Yeah, I did, I had a point. And then what happened was I was like, guys, I'm out of here. Like, I can't do this. Like, this is brutal. My point is this, and I'll just say, it. and then they went over to get the female. There was two more females, and they started. And then um, Jeremy's daughter went over and was tugging on um, Matt, and he, she said, "What are you gonna do with nice nice?" <laughs> they had named it nice nice, and that's when I was like, "I'm just, I'm out of here, bro. I'm leaving." <laughs> I came back for the party, but um, so here's the thing: is in the Old Testament times. Blood sacrifice, slaughtering of animals, it was much more understood. We are so far removed from the reality. We, you know, we, we might go to a church and understand the liturgy of the Eucharist, the, the, the little cups of wine or whatever you use. The liturgy of the Old Testament was spilled blood of animals. This, we need to understand the Lord is, a, is, the Lord is a very liturgical God. And what I mean by that is he uses object lessons. He puts it graphically in front of us to communicate deeper spiritual truths. And so when the Lord says to Abram, cut a cow in half. How many have skinned a deer? 
I mean, there's still only a handful. How many have cut a cow in half? A cow! This was a gory, bloody, horrific mess. He has in place two parts, and he makes a path down the middle. He brought all these to him, cut them in two, laid them half. The birds of prey came down. Abraham, uh, Abram drove them away. Skip forward to verse. Well, I've got a little picture there. See, in the Hebrew, they call it the, um, uh, the Brit HaBetarim. It's the covenant between the parts. We, we sanitize it and call it the Abrahamic covenant. The Hebrews call it the covenant between the parts of the animals. But uh, verse, skipping forward to verse 12 and then 17. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep falls on Abram. And terror and great darkness falls upon him. The Lord gives him a dream and a prophecy. We're going to skip that. It came about when the sun had set, it was very dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between the pieces. Now, I don't, honestly, I don't know what this was. We hear oven and we think like stainless steel. No, you know, I don't know exactly. The smoke and fire, something, appears and it passes down the middle of this row, this bloody, gory mess. This was the Lord appearing in some type of form. The Lord himself walked in between the pieces. What was the point? Why, why all of this graphic, bloody display? Why kill the, the, the cow? The Lord was making it absolutely crystal clear. This was a covenant. It was a covenant unto death. May I, the creator of the universe, die like these animals if I don't keep what I'm promising right now. This is what he was saying. How many of you think he's going to keep those promises? How many of you think that that was all just a metaphor for something else spiritual and he never really meant that? You know, this is, oh, but Joel, N.T. Wright. He's brilliant. Yeah, he is brilliant. But he's wrong. I mean, he's fundamentally misrepresenting the very character of God. This was not a metaphor. God is faithful in a very literal sense. How many of you um, wives would really appreciate it if your husband said, you know, honey, I have been metaphorically faithful to you throughout our whole marriage. <laughs> that, but that's what we're saying about God. Not literally, but you know, it doesn't mean, that didn't mean anything. Spiritually, I've been totally faithful to you. I'm sure there's been idiots out there that have pulled that. God is not like that. He is faithful. Amen. He is literally faithful. I'm not saying the scriptures aren't filled with metaphor. They are. And there's some difficult passages within the apocalyptic literature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But God is faithful in a very real, meaningful way. Verse 18, on that day... The Lord made a covenant with Abraham. What did he say? He said, to your descendants, I'm going to give this land. Now, what the replacement theology guys will say is they'll say, you are trying to limit God. You're making him so small. God is not interested in a little piece of real estate anymore. He's out for every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. He doesn't show favoritism, blah, 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 right? And look, I agree with a lot of those sentiments. He has thrown the doors wide open. This plan is for every tongue, tribe, people, and nation, whosoever, all, everyone, right? But the plan, the way that he has chosen to carry it out is that this piece of land becomes the platform. It becomes the launching pad. It becomes the very basis through which he will redeem all of creation and bless every nation throughout the earth. It's very simple. That's the way he's chosen to do it. Who are we to say, you, God, would never do it that way? Because the bottom line, guys, is this is how he does everything. Um, uh, Julie was just with me in Israel um, in November. And, um, you know, for a lot of people that go to Israel for the first time, the Holy Land... This is the Holy Land. This is Jerusalem, the capital where Jesus is going to reign over the nations. The first time I was in Jerusalem, 94, I got up the first night, the first night after being there, I got up early in the morning. I said to my buddy, let's get up real early and we're going to walk the Via Dolorosa. I got up like real early, you know, like dawn. I walked around the corner. I shouldn't even tell the story, it's horrible. I walked around the corner 
and there was a guy with his pants around his ankles going, um, uh, <laughs> trying to find a, um, <laughs> his morning constitution on the street and the Via Dolorosa. Welcome to the Holy Land. Um, we, had some friend, we had some friends on the, on the tour. They got there. They got to Tel Aviv. They got out. They laid down on the beach. They said, let's take a little nap. They woke up. Someone stole their wallets out of their bags. Um, you, Tel Aviv. I was just in Las Vegas. There's all these little cards everywhere for, for prostitutes, call girls. There, it's pornography. It's all over the ground. Tel Aviv. Same thing. Strip clubs, drug-addled kids strewed out everywhere. It's a mockery. Satan is doing his best to make it a mockery. We're there in Jerusalem. There's stabbings going on, you know, in the news every day. You know, we never saw any of it. And there's too many tour buses, you know. Wait a minute. This is the capital that the king of the universe is going to rule over the nations from. It's a city of contradictions and religious conflict. And it's messy and it's dirty and Satan does everything. And it, don't get me wrong. There's a certain beauty to it, too. But it is not the shining gem, the capital of what the prophets saw. Yeah. Satan is doing everything he can to make it a mockery. But listen, I'm the same way. And so are you. This is how the Lord works. He chooses this dried up, ugly little brown seed. And what will happen when that thing sprouts and we, and we essentially sprout and blossom and we receive immortality? That is unfathomable. But he begins with some little, seemingly, you know, contradictory, conflicted, ugly, just earthly thing. And the land of Israel, no, that is not all that God is about. But he has chosen, and he always chooses to use the weak and the foolish and the broken. And then out of that, he brings beauty and redemption. The Lord is interested in real estate because he made a vow unto death about real estate. He has a plan. Who are we to say, he would never do it that way. He can't do it that way. Yes, it's open to everyone, but it's going to happen through a particular means. And ultimately, everything he does is what? To demonstrate his goodness, to demonstrate his faithfulness, and to show, let every man be found a liar. And God is true in the end. It's not because of our strength. It's not because of Israel's strength. It's not because of our faithfulness. It's all because of his faithfulness. Period. <clears throat> Let me just, uh, very briefly, what was promised? To whom were the promises made? How long are they good for? Three questions, right? Genesis 17. Now, this, these, these questions are answered multiple, multiple, multiple times throughout the scriptures. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for 2,000 years. <laughs> Everlasting covenant to be your God to you and your descendants after you. I will give to you and your descendants after you the land of your sojournings all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. These promises are reiterated over and over and over again throughout the prophets. Things don't change when we get to the New Testament. They are still in place. Psalm 105, 6 through 11. I'll let you look that up on your own. Same thing. I've got a map here which simply shows uh, if you go to the Bible atlases, what is the promised land? This is loosely uh, a picture of what the promised land is. It doesn't go all the way over to Iraq. It doesn't follow the Euphrates all the way down to Basra and the Gulf. It does the Euphrates in the north. And if you read the various descriptions, it comes back to sort of the Sea of Galilee, down the Jordan, all the way down to the Sinai. That land, some would argue that it has been possessed by, you know, under the Sol Solomon's kingdom, that sort of period. Others say, no, not quite. Some people will point to passages in, um, uh, in uh, Joshua that says the Lord fulfilled all his promises. But what's funny is, and I'll just say this, the Bible answer man was uh, attacking, critiquing uh, my book, and he says, well, what, you know, Joel doesn't realize is it says in Joshua that the Lord fulfilled all of his promises. All of them were kept. And so he doesn't understand that. The Lord has already fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant. And of course, you know, when, if, if a supersessionist says this, you just say, checkmate. 
Because when you say that, you admit that God's promises were to give them the land. The problem is they are everlasting. So if you just admitted that his promises were to give them the land, then everlasting promises cannot be fulfilled in one generation. So they are still ongoing. But, you know, it sounds good in a soundbite when you have the radio. But um, in any case, the Lord will fulfill his promises to Israel. They're not yet fulfilled. They are still ongoing. We're awaiting their ultimate fulfillment. We're going to discuss this more as, we, uh, as the weekend unfolds. Now, let me just make this summary of the Abrahamic covenant. It was made to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Later in Galatians and elsewhere, we are told that we, through faith, get to be part of that covenant. We get to be part of that inheritance. And uh, we won't delineate all that that, that that entails, but essentially we, by faith, become Abraham's children. But the covenant was made to the descendants in a very real way to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants and their descendants after them. The primary emphasis of the promise concerned a very specific, a very real, a very literal, a very identifiable piece of land. Now, this is the point, is the promise was unilateral and unconditional. What does that mean? Abraham was in a deep sleep. It was not an agreement between two parties. It was unilateral. God said, I'm going to do this. It's not contingent. Now, Abraham expressed faith. And the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. But it's not ultimately about Israel's faithfulness. God is going to fulfill these things. And so therefore his promise is ongoing, irrevocable, and everlasting. I've repeated that multiple times. Now, um, because of time, I'm going to sort of skip forward and just say a few things. When we get to the Mosaic Covenant, we get to the Mosaic Covenant, the Lord essentially says to uh, you know, he had, Moses comes down. The Lord makes a covenant. Now, according to Paul, this is roughly 430 years after the Abrahamic covenant. The Mosaic covenant is a bilateral agreement, a contract between two parties, the God of heaven and Israel. And it's defined not by, I'm going to do this. It's if you, then I. If you do this, then I'm going to do this. If you don't do this, here are all the bad things that are going to happen. And he basically says, if you don't obey these things, and they agree and they say yes, there's a very, very big difference between the Abrahamic and the Mosaic. He says, if you don't do all of these things, you're going to be spit out of the land. You're going to be wiped out. But then after a while, I'm going to, out of my mercy and goodness, I'm going to bring you back. And this has happened throughout history. And it's crazy that a people would be boomeranged in and out of their nation throughout history. No one else, this has never happened. It's exactly what it says in, the, in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, I mean, throughout the, the Mosaic Covenant where it's reiterated. It's exactly what's happened. And so here you have the unilateral covenant versus the bilateral agreement, and then skip forward to the Davidic Covenant. 2 Samuel 7 now, notice that the Davidic covenant begins with a reiteration of the Abrahamic. Verse 10, I will also, now the Lord's speaking to David. He says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. I will appoint a place for them. I will plant them that they may live in their own land, that they won't be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them anymore as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And I will give them rest from all of your enemies verse 11, or verse 12 through 16, the Lord declares to you, to David, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete, David, you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your descendant after you. Now, this is not just Solomon who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So now the Lord says, not only am I gonna give your descendants the land, I'm gonna give you a king. It's not just a land, it's a kingdom. Your house and your kingdom will be established and door before me forever and your throne shall be established forever. So this is the Davidic covenant. Again, it is a unilateral promise. It's not a bilateral agreement. The Lord promised I'm gonna do this. And then we get to the new covenant. I'm not gonna read all of the various passages. The new covenant is spoken of several times in the Old Testament by Isaiah, by Ezekiel, by Jeremiah. Isaiah 59, verse 20 through 21. A redeemer will come to Zion, 
And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord, as for this, this is my covenant. So now we're moving past the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic, and now the Lord through the prophets starts speaking of another covenant, says the Lord. And this is what this covenant will entail. My spirit, he says, which is upon you. My words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the offspring's offspring from now on and forevermore. So this new covenant involves his spirit being inside them and him putting his words into their mouths. Jeremiah 31, verse 1, skipping forward to 31 through 32. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they shall be my people. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with them, with their fathers when I took them by the hand out of Egypt, not like the Mosaic, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Notice this, that the Lord says, and in those days, it's speaking of the age of the Messiah. So this is, this is tricky theologically. The, the new covenant has been made in his blood and we are partakers of it, but it is not yet fulfilled until all Israel comes in because this is the language of the covenants. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God. They shall be my people. They will not teach their neighbors, say, no, brother, know the Lord. No, they will all know me from the least to the greatest and I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So again, it's very clear. It's to Israel. All of Israel is going to be part of that which we are already a part of. And until that day comes, we cannot, as intercessors, as the praying church, we cannot rest. Even as you look out at Jerusalem, we are to pray until it is a praise in all the earth. It is not there yet. Until sin and and death is a thing of the past, we cannot rest. Until all Israel is saved, there is, it is as if there is an accusation in the earth against God. You could deliver all of these stupid pagans, but not your own people? Are you capable of fulfilling that which you said you would do? And that's what the day of the Lord is about, is is saying, yes, I, I... I was able to accomplish all that I promised. Skipping forward to Ezekiel, same thing, 36, 22 through 28. Say to the house of Israel, says the Lord God, I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring them to their own land. Notice it's always about the land. Then I will sprinkle you with clean water, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you of your filthiness from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, a new spirit. Within you, I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. I'll cause you to walk in my ways, my statutes, and you will be careful to observe all of the things that I command. You will live in the land and you will be my people and I will be your God. The new covenant is ultimately how the Lord will fulfill the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. It is through the new covenant. The new covenant is the crowning completion of the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant can no more be done away with than the new covenant that was cut in his blood, that was made with his blood. They are both blood promises. They are both blood vows. They are both as good as the very word of God. His word can be trusted, period. So let me just conclude uh, tonight's session by saying this, that when we understand that all that's unfolding in the earth right now, it is about the Lord bringing to fruition these promises. You know, I, as I said, I, um, I'm from Boston, so I grew up, you know, in like hurricane land, right? Hurricanes, they're very different than tornadoes. Do you guys, do, so does St. Louis get tornadoes? You get um, oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, all the way down Oklahoma, I mean, just Texas. And so, you know, I moved from hurricane land to tornado land. And it's so funny because my dad, like, <laughs> he's going blind. So he, he, he listens, you know, he'll be watching TV. He doesn't have. And so he'll call me up. He'll be like, tornado, get in the basement. I'm like, dad, that's 800 miles away on the, like, 
the edge of Kansas. You know, it's destroying somebody's cul-de-sac, and I feel bad for them, but we don't need to get in the basement yet. But he, he still has that, that hurricane mentality, you know, thing like engulfs the whole East Coast or whatever. The end times is, it's, it's kind of like a hurricane, right? It begins as this tropical cell. And next thing you know, it builds and it builds. And next thing you know, it's engulfing the entire, you know, Florida and the whole, all the Gulf states. And it's like, you look at the map and it's swallowing the nation. The state of Israel today, it is the geographic epicenter of all of these things. And this, what's beginning as a tropical cell is eventually going to engulf the whole earth. The, the hurricane, the, the, the rage of Satan, as Satan rages against the fulfillment of God's purposes and promises. And if you want to understand the end times, it's, it's really that simple. The storms are going to fill the earth and engulf, and every nation will feel the impact of the storms that are coming. And it's all about God fulfilling his promises. One little brief storm. I mean, it's not little, but I mean, it's in the big picture. It is brief it is brief, and it's not all about the storm. We need to understand the storm. We need to have discernment about the storm. But that is not what it's about. That's just evidence of the beauty of what's coming. It's just evidence of how upset Satan is. He doesn't want to get cast into the abyss. And the storm is going to be literal with natural disasters. It's going to be economic. It's going to be ideological. It's going to involve ideas. And that storm is already sweeping throughout the earth. And one of the ways that it is sweeping even through the church is by the theology of replacement theology. Yeah. And if we as a people want to be faithful in our mandate to be a praying church at the end of the age, to be a, a prophetic church, and what I mean by that is that we understand the word of God, the word of the prophets, and we pray according to what he said he's going to do and what's unfolding. You know, it, it's, you know... You can sit in a room, and, and I'm not, and, and you know, I, I've sat in prayer meetings where people got up and prayed for, like, the football team, like the Chiefs to win. I was like, I think this is a waste of prayer time. <laughs> you know, like, interceding for the Chiefs, like, bless, this was back, bless uh, Montana, and that goes way back. We want to be people that, you know, we don't have much time. We don't have much resources. I don't have much energy. I really want to utilize my time, my money, my, money, my energy, and my prayer um, as best I can. And the best way that you can maximize all of your investments is to partner with what God's doing, to discern and understand what the Lord's doing. And when you pray and you join what God's doing, oh, it makes it so much easier. And that's what being a praying church, or being a prophetic church, is about discerning the word of God and praying accordingly. And so as these things unfold in the earth, we will have understanding. We will know how to pray. We will know how to respond. We'll know what to do. And those days are quickly coming upon us. So let me pray and wrap up tonight. And we'll jump in tomorrow and get into some uh, little bit more detail. Why don't, we, um, why don't we all go ahead and stand, if you would. We just barely scratch the surface. Father, we thank you. Father, we together tonight, we thank you. We thank you that you opened our eyes, that you saved us from the kingdom of darkness, that you brought us into this family, that we are citizens of this coming kingdom, that our citizenship in this coming kingdom is as good as done, that you've given us the Holy Spirit, you've sealed You've sealed our future citizenship. You've sealed our future immortality. You've given us the down payment, the promise, the seal, the guarantee. And we say that we're not our own. We've been bought. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to you. We say that we have died to this life. We've died to this world. We've died to this present age. And we ask that you would cause our hearts to be fixed and anchored and rooted in the hope and the joy and the beauty of all that you have for us in the days ahead. We ask that as the storms begin to rage and swell and flood the earth, that our hearts would be firmly anchored, the anchor of hope for our soul, that we would not be like those that are 
that are easily shaken, that are easily filled with fear. We would not be like those that are easily distracted, that our eyes would be fixed in the midst of the chaos on the king that's coming back and that our prayers would be energized and our hearts would burn even as your heart burns. Lord, we say that we want to burn with the things that your heart burns for. We ask even tonight that you would take a drop of your heart and you would put it into ours because we can't do this in and of our own strength. We can't psych ourselves up. We can't get ourselves worked up to get excited unless you touch us by your Holy Spirit. And so even tonight and over this, the next couple days, we ask that you would burn something deep into our spirits and that you would even plant a stake here at Southgate and in this community and that you would raise up you would raise up a, a praying people throughout this whole region that would flow and move with all, that you're, uh, that all of your purposes, all that you're accomplishing and about to accomplish in the earth. That you would energize and empower the prayers and the worship that's gone, going up from this place. Again, we thank you for the beauty of who you are. And we bless your name in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.